talking yesterday about. Every time you get vaccinated, you get vaccinated. Okay. No, I just didn't want to. Yeah. I just didn't want to leave. Thinking that you get vaccinated a lot. They said. They said. We're just we're we're watching this video. And this lady was gardening and she didn't have gloves on and she was just because fingernails were so nasty. And I went, yes. Yes. You know, it's like it's like I don't. I was thinking of you. <laughs> you always do the same thing, and I'm like, check this because there at the building, it's just the landscape is so bad, and I've you know complained, and it's like, do I have to have a cleanup day here? You know, I mean, can you at least mow the yard? You know, it's it's terrible. Yeah, at the administration, the Frost Bank building oh, where the yeah, POC yeah. and stuff is. It's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrible. There's palm branches all over the place. There's trash everywhere. And the fire chief and I are out there in the morning. I was going to buy one. Trash. I can't buy like, yeah. yeah. it. Like, we should not be doing I was just like, see the thing, the utilities garden. We need some mulch out there. I can find it, I'm sure. Yeah. I was going to buy one. and I Yeah, they just. I haven't been over there, well, at least in a year. Okay. Well, but if I go over there, at least if I do a drive by, then I can tell Michael, you need to do this and this and this and this and this and this. But looking at the contracts, I feel hesitant to ask for much other than what's on there. Just the trimming, right? They've been trimming. They don't believe. No, they're not real good about no, so you just email and tell me hey, they've been good about I, I will have to say that I've never like seen a, a landscape company that was good about like pulling a, weeds. Um, <laughs> you whenever Abby, to to well, you know, my daughter Abby, whenever she was um, living and working in Warehouse Virginia, of Holly, uh, she was working because her oh, she she has a degree in landscape architecture. Oh, yeah. Anyway, she always had the seasonal workers that were usually from. Um, you know, somewhere in Central America and stuff, and they, you know, they came, you know, every year legally and, um, you know, would be there. And, and she's like, all these guys want to do is run machines, you know, something that you could, you know, and she's just like, no, you're going to learn to pull weeds. <laughs> but they had a really high end. Um, clientele, a lot of, you know, professional athletes and politicians and lobbyists and stuff. I mean, people that had helipads, tennis courts, swimming pools, that rivers that, you know, ran around the entire property. And so you know, everything had to be so. Yeah, yeah, and she's like, no, you're going to bend over, you're going to pull weeds. <laughs> I so just every way I can yeah. think of kind of now like most landscape companies yeah. do not oh, well, yeah, so that, so our right. awesome. are good at cleaning out and trimming yeah. um just other than right. the garden. Well, I'll take a, I'll drive by sometime yeah, so and take a look at it, so then I can tell Michael. Now this needs to be, and that needs to be, and you know. There's some things that have to go. Spiky trees. I don't know what they're called. Spiky spikes. Yeah, they're pretty big and really Oh, a bovophilia. They would be down on the not on the upper part, down on the lower part where the gravel and stuff. And yeah, bovophilia. They're gone. It's not actually on high. I'm at. Those are not fun to pull out. Patty, can you hear me? I had one, and I'm not going to replant it. You know, at my house, no more. No. If they're they're warehouse, yeah. You go to cross cross town and get on all these different. Well, and then you the you might cross in palm trees. You might want to cross. It's not really on. That's the ones. It's kind of weird because they recently turned those. Um, Once you go there, you maybe left a couple of years that into I had that parts just head towards the big building over there. You know, the downtown yeah, area yeah. and the C district. Yeah, they got to find them. And I around. had to call, um, you know, other landscape companies to come out and trim them because parks wouldn't do it. So you can try with parks and, you know, say, they look so great downtown. Can you come to ours too? Yeah, please, 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 Oh, you can be the one that's on my house. It wasn't going to be me. I'm Randy. I don't know if they're wanting us to weather at the moment. Um, they, have, they have something going on this weekend. It's just the same. <coughs> they were with all the rain and all the mowing and everything. We're 
Good. You're good. Fall by yourself. Good. Very good. So our handouts over there is to come in and uh, you're on the left corner over there. Well, I actually moved them over oh, to the table to the so that they could see them when you came in. There's just they're on um, the table. <laughs> There's a, a zero escape plant guide. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Joanne Salchi. Uh, Kevin Gibbs. Kevin Gibbs. And um, I'm a New Aces County Master Gardener. And um, I also work for the City of Corpus Christi Fire Department and Emergency Planning Committee whenever, so I have a day job. But um, Kevin? I'm an uh, extension horticulturist for New Aces County. Um, and we also are part of uh, the City of Corpus Christi uh, Searscape Steering Committee. And so um, in the early 90s, there was um, a garden that was uh, created uh, adjacent to this uh, Museum of Science and History. And um, the reason that that was created was because we knew that every, about every four years that we would be in a drought cycle. And so um, that garden has been there for uh, basically since 1993 and has grown and has become a mature garden. It's gone through several hurricanes and uh, most recently uh, frost that did more damage than the hurricanes had done previously. But it's there to be a, a best management practice for the city's water department. And we do have three representatives from the city's water department that also um, are part of our zero escape steering committee. So the city's water utilities has been very supportive of the group for many, many years. And um, the master gardeners have provided a lot of the workforce and our, um, uh, our horticulture extension agent has always been there to kind of advise us in the direction that we need to go in. So today we wanna to talk a little bit about Xeriscape. And uh, one of the things that has always bothered me is that a lot of people talk about Xeriscape instead of Xeriscape. So uh, the title is, there is no O in Xeriscape. A good place to start whenever you're thinking about any uh, lawn project is to assess what you already have. Um, you're going to need to think about who uses the space and any future uh, use. You know, maybe you're planning on having a family, maybe you're planning on having a dog or putting in a pool. So all of those things should, should really play into your planning and preparation for any landscape project you're going to do. Also, what do I want it to look like? Uh, what do I like about my area and what don't I like? What do you want to get rid of? And, you know, what have you seen on Pinterest or, you know, in a magazine that you really liked and would like to replicate? Also, when can I get started and how much time do I have to dedicate to my project, uh, whether it's constructing it or whether it's maintaining it. Uh, even if it's a Xeriscape um, style of, of uh, landscape, there's always going to be maintenance. Also, where do you wanna place trees, pathways, beds? All of those things should be considered whenever you're thinking about um, where you're going to place the next ones. And also thinking about where your utility poles are, where fences are, driveway, sidewalks, any type of hard surface, that's certainly going to have a bearing on what you're going to plant where. 
And then you need to think about how can I do this? Is this something that I can do myself or do I need to call in, you know, a professional to help me? And then, you know, when am I going to start and am I go how am I going to approach it? Xeriscape is an investment in your uh, landscape and in, uh, and in your prop. Well, your landscape is an investment in your, your comfort and value of your property. Um, you know, whenever you're driving about, I'm sure all of us have seen that yard that is just gorgeous. And you know, you're wondering how much time they have to spend and who does all of this. So uh, it does add to that curb appeal. It's, it makes it something that, that you want to have uh, in your own space. And Xeriscape can increase the value of your property. Utilizing the principles of Xeriscape, you can actually reduce your water consumption and your maintenance by about 60%. It also extends our water supplies. As um, most of us know, you know we've been um, it very dry recently uh, until just a week or so ago, we finally got some beneficial rains. But looking at um, you know, the area, we've been very, very dry. And we know that this is a cyclical thing, that about every four years, we are going to be experiencing some form of drought. So Xeriscape is also a landscape style, or it's not a landscape style. Any garden can be a, land, or a Xeriscape garden. It's more of a concept of water conservation that we can apply to whether it's a Japanese style garden or you know, whether you go really uh, heavy into the Southwest with cactus and succulents. So it's, it, it's just these good gardening principles that you're going to put into your own space. Whenever you're thinking about the design principles, um, simplicity, scale, focal points, and the one third rule are things that you really need to keep in mind. Simplicity is whenever you're choosing plants that, that look good together, that have some sort of relationship where one is not competing with each other, so that they're there to enhance each other. And also you wanna think about the scale. Um, if you have just a small cottage or bungalow, you're certainly not gonna to wanna to place massive plantings there. You're gonna to wanna to put something that is in relationship to the size of the structure or to the size of the lot. Focal points are uh, highlighted by the size, color, and texture. These are the accent points. These are the things that draw you in. It may be uh, a plant that you know, blooms seasonally and is just vibrant in colors and brings in a lot of your pollinators, um, but it's something that's going to draw your eye into it. So there should be something that is that focal point. A focal point could also be a water feature, a piece of um, you know, sculpture or art. It could be some really cool pots. It could be whatever's going to draw you into that location. And the one third rule is where you're having your beds, your turf and your hardscape all in about one third. We certainly recommend that from a, um, a standpoint of grass, grass is always going to be your thirstiest plant. And so if you're gonna have um, grass in your lawn, try to keep it down to about that one third or 20, 25%, because again, that's where a lot of your water is going to go. About one third of all of the uh, treated water in the state of Texas is going on landscape. And so you know, we need to back that number down and uh, become more efficient. This would be an example of, of simplicity. You have different types of plants, different blooms, but they're similar heights and textures. And they're lower, you know, with higher, and um, you know, the, the higher ones are gonna provide a good you know, background or structure, but they're not competing with each other. This would also be simplicity, it's on a different scale, but again, you've got types of plants that are very open and airy and kind of grass-like, sort of like you know, some of the things that you would see over here. And so again, they're not competing with each other, they're enhancing each other. You also have to have a really big space to have that big mound of grass in there. This one would be a good example of scale. It is a large lot, it's large structures, and so they've got multiple layers of plants, 
and they've used uh, trees as background. They've got you know the hardscape of the fence, and so you know there's a whole lot of landscape in there in a very large area. These are also examples. Again, you've got that same large uh, home residence, and so they've got pathways and gardens and gates and landscaping that's going all around it. On the right side, you've got a very simple structure, very simple gate. You've got very natural <coughs> elements, and you don't have a lot of plantings, but it looks really clean and very modern and nice. In this case, you can see the focal points. You, plants are separated. They're not all up on each other. There's a good amount of separation, so each plant kind of has its own personality, but you can also see into that area and um, it makes you want to see what else is there. More examples, um, they just use some common um, walls and some um, kind of artsy features. Very few plants, but it looks really nice. It's very clean, it's very simple, and you know, it's something that could be done on a, a commercial site or a residential site. And there would also be very minimal uh, amount of maintenance, but it looks very good and very well done. Whenever you're doing uh, your landscape, you wanna create an overall plan of opportunities and challenges. And think about how you can do things in phases. Right now, we've just gone through some really uh, rough times in February. And so a lot of us kind of have a blank slate. You know, we lost certain plants and it's a good opportunity for us to rethink what could I do differently than, the, than I did before. For myself, I'm a very eclectic gardener and I go to the garden centers and you know, or anywhere and I see something and I want it. You know, and it may not fit with what I've got, but I want it. And so, you know, I have, um, I, I have definitely had to rethink my plantings uh, in my backyard because I, I did lose a lot. And so now I'm actually looking at it from a different viewpoint than I did 25 years ago and putting things in a, in a little different order and not scrunching everything so much, you know, together, because I do still want to have everything, you know, it's like, oh, if it grows, I gotta have it. So, um, but this is really a good time for us to evaluate what lived, what didn't live, and what we want to do for the future. Um, it's always important to think about play areas if you have children or dogs, um, you know, dogs are always going to have pathways, children are always going to have pathways. You know, do you have a soccer star? Are you playing basketball back there? What are you doing in your yard? And also you need to think about um, whenever you're making your plan, you know, where do I have sun? Where do I have shade? Do I have slopes? Um, where are my water sources? So all of those things really play into uh, that plan. And it's always good to come up with some sort of plan before you start. Um, consider rainwater harvesting or considering uh, redirecting you know, the flow of, of water on your property. And also it's always good to you know, ask your, your local authorities, your, your, your landscape professionals that are here locally, you know, what's gonna work based on where you are. Here we're gonna have either heavy clay soil or sandier soil. And so most of the time we do have to do amendments and certainly some things are going to do better um, say, you know, on the, the western part of the county versus over here. So it just, you need to think about the, the type of soil you've got. This is just uh, the design of the, of the Xeriscape Garden, which again is uh, adjacent to the Museum of Science and History. This was done by local landscape architect, Doug Wade. And um, the garden has changed a lot since 1993 and you know it will continue to change. One of the things that you might do if you've got a slope that you're not real sure about and you don't want to mow it and it's you know it's hard to maintain some sort of vegetation that's going to fill in but not look um, you know too uh, unkept or rangy you know something that's also going to hold the soil in place. 
If you've got drainage problems, one of your solutions might be to have um, a rain garden of some sort. You know, here you've got um, you know some some significant rocks and some things that are going to do well even with wet feet. And it's important to remember that you need to uh, ensure that that water is going to be used up and absorbed because otherwise, um, right now we all are complaining about the mosquitoes. So making sure that you're getting that water um, where it needs to be. Um, you want to try to avoid it going to the storm drains because that's your water. You want to keep it as much as you can, but find ways to make sure that it's not pooling or collecting and creating an issue with vectors. Here, um, you may have a limited water source, and so you can see that they've utilized the natural slope of the ground. They've put in kind of a dry creek bed look, and they've also are there collecting water in a tank. So they're they're making sure that they're keeping it all as, as they can and utilizing it in their own property. This is probably not a good example of a, a something that you would want to do if you had pets and children. Uh, it, it's not as friendly as some yards, but it's gorgeous. And so there may be an area that that you can put um, things that are going to be really tough and durable, but at the same time, really not reach out and grab your family or your neighbors or your passerbys. You know, there's always, uh, I think in every neighborhood, there's always uh, that one household that every weekend, every night, there's always a million cars and you're always thinking about, I'm going to plant cactus in that little parkway strip so that they don't park in front of my yard because they pull up in my yard and you know and then there's no place for myself to park or any of my guests but you know and i've always thought you know plant these really you know nasty plants i haven't done i'm a good neighbor i mow their grass and i pull their weeds but i've always wanted to do it but i didn't so it's that you know good person bad person you know the inner conflict Soil preparation, uh, having good soil is um, one of the most important things to a successful garden. Um, we always recommend that you do soil testing periodically. And I know Kevin will probably be talking a little bit more about uh, uh, soil um, testing and the qualities of, of good soil. But again, we do tend to have either very sandy uh, soil or very hard black clay. So you're going to have to consider some amendments. Appropriate plant selection is very important. Um, I came here from Ohio. I thought everything that I had there, I could grow here. I quickly found out that that, that didn't work at all. So I killed a lot of plants. Um, I brought a lot of plants back with me and they died too. Um, and so then I had to start thinking about, okay, enjoy the ones you have here and learn about them. So we need to have plants that are going to be adapted um, to our climate and soil. Um, sometimes with your big box stores, they're going to be buying for a very large area. So whenever you walk through their store, you may see these wonderful hydrangeas and they're just gorgeous and you want them all over your yard. Well, they'll be there for a little while, but they probably won't live too long. So keep in mind what's good for here. It, uh, that beautiful hydrangea is going to be very short lived. So read your plant labels and consider the mature size of the plant. Don't overcrowd them. They need air moving around them. Sometimes you'll see people with um, you know, these tiny little esperanzas and they're in these cute little pots you know, and they'll buy, you know, 20 of them to put, you know, in a strip. Well, before the summer's over, they're going to be six to seven foot tall and they're all crowded. So make sure that you do know how big they're going to be so that at the place you put them in, they're going to have plenty of room. It's good to choose plants of different heights, colors, and textures. And even though we live in an area that we don't have clearly defined seasons, we still have seasons. So think about what is this plant going to look like in December? What's it going to look like in July? You know, um, there's variations. It may have leaves on it. It may not have leaves on it. So whenever you're thinking of your overall plan, think about what it will be 
um, in various times of the year and all of those colors and shades. Um, and also know where your uh, sunny areas are and your shady areas. Some things that are not as tough and durable, you're gonna wanna put them where they're getting a little less sun. This obviously is something that can handle full sun. It can handle the drought. Um, a lot of that is gonna reseed itself and it's gonna look good most of the year. But again, that still is a lot of work keeping it looking that way too, even though um, you know, you're gonna try to avoid some of the cactus. Putting plants in, in zones where you have a primary zone, that's where your grass, your turf is gonna be. That's again, where most of your water is going to go. And then the plants that are the thirstiest. Um, you know, if you've got impatience, you know, in a pot, you may want to put them on your patio so you remember to water them. They're not going to do well um, in the summer out in the middle of, of the full sun and heat. Your secondary zone is where most of your beds are going to go. And, um, you know, that's where most of your curb appeal, your visual appeal is going to be. Your minimal zone is usually the part of your property that you really tend to forget about. Um, mine is an area around the back of the house that's over by dining room windows that has pavers and I have pots. And I tend to forget about those pots. About once a week I'll go, I haven't watered them in a long time. So um, if you're gonna have that, that area that you just kind of never get to, make sure it's something tough and durable. Shade gardening is certainly a luxury down here. Um, you may want to uh, have that shade gardening. Uh, you may want to consider not even putting irrigation in that area. It's easier to hand water. And those are usually in the areas where we'll have like our patios and you know our seating areas where we're going to spend time, where we'll sit down with a magazine or a book or the kids will play or you'll eat dinner. So whenever you've got shade gardening, you know, think about what's going to do well in shade. This was a picture from the Xeriscape Garden a few years ago. It was a beautiful plant, but it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was uh, growing out onto uh, the pathways and walkways. And at the end of each one of those is, a, you know, a large black barb. And so it became a hazard for anybody that's passing by. And you know, if you clip those little barbs off the ends, um, it kind of scars it and disfigures it. And so think about this, this little blue plant that we put in there became a really big blue plant. And so you have to remember to put the right plant in the right place. Xeriscape offers lots of choices. Um, most people think that Xeriscape is just those agaves and cactus and aloes and those type of things. But whenever you're thinking of Xeriscape, it can be anything that's adaptable. And again, by putting it in the right place and doing the right preparation, you can have a wide variety of things that aren't as harsh as, as some might think. This is an example of putting different textures and colors together, but it looks wonderful. You've got the sage and the hamelia, and uh, you know, it all looks really nice together. It's vibrant, it's inviting, but again, it's plants that, that will all do well together. I don't know, I think we're on. All right, so um, like she said, you use the one third rule and one of the things you want to do is limit the amount of turf that you put in because the turf takes the most amount of water out of any plants that we put in there. By the way, I wanted to mention that, you know, what xeriscape means here versus what xeriscape means in East Texas are still, they're still following the same principles, but it's clear that, that you're getting to pick uh, more water loving plants that when you move to an area that has more rainfall. But, we still managed to make it with plants that make it on less than an inch of rain uh, per week. So, uh, so turf grasses consume the most amount of water. So we try to limit them, uh, try to select a turf grass that will work. If you're picking a grass for a sunny area, 
you can pick either St. Augustine or you can pick Bermuda grass here. Or out here, I think the C, uh, C. Pasbalum works fairly well as also, so you can pick that as well. And then avoid high water varieties. So it's, it's easy for us because there's not a whole lot more that grows down here anyway. Uh, there are a few places that have zoysia and I've seen a few zoysia lawns that are okay. But uh, clearly, the St. Augustine and the uh, Bermuda are the better choices. And then avoid uh, turf on steep slopes. And like Joanne was saying earlier, you know, clearly, if you have a kid who's going to be a soccer star, maybe you don't want to limit the turf as much. Maybe you want to make sure you leave enough room for them to do what they need to do. But if you, if your family is is not a big sport family and and you're just out in the back enjoying the, the patio table and enjoying the areas, then definitely limit the amount of turf down to that one third rule. And then consider pavers or ground covers instead of turf. You can fill a lot of area with, with pavers uh, and not have to water it at all, as opposed to having uh, the entire thing full of grass. How many of you have big lawns? It, it's, I, I used to not mind mowing so much when I was younger, but I'm finding now the older I get that I was like, I wish I had less grass. I'm out there mowing and mowing and mowing it. So limiting it is definitely a good thing. So here's some ways that you could limit your turf. Uh, you can uh, put in some smaller, smaller areas and then with pavers. And then again, they put uh, rock on either side and just put a small patch of turf down the center. And that works very well. So like I said, there's really only a few choices for grasses here in South Texas. One of those is Bermuda grass. And uh, I think you'll notice on the handout that the Bermuda grass uh, variety that we recommend is Celebration. And then it's not the only Bermuda grass variety that'll work here, but we found that, that it's very successful in this area. And then St. Augustine, uh, Floor Town. And uh, we're, we're really interested to see how St. All the St. Augustine varieties came through this this freeze. So um, I know immediately after the freeze, it was very patchy. Uh, there were lots of empty spots. Uh, I've had lots of calls from people calling me and saying, "I've got weeds everywhere." Well, yeah, because there were we hardly ever have our grasses go dormant here. So when the grasses went dormant, the bare spots showed up, and the weeds said, "Aha! I have a chance," and, and they took off. So we're just telling people to either hand pull the weeds or uh, mow them and keep them from going to seed and that the grasses should return back to normal at some point. So I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly. Bermuda, uh, the advantages to Bermuda is that there's lots of varieties. It can be sodded or it can be seeded. Uh, it's very useful for uh, golf courses and play areas. It takes more foot traffic uh, and uh, it's drought resistant. The disadvantage to it is it takes a lot of water and it takes quite a bit of fertilizer. It also can become invasive. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever uh, had to pull Bermuda grass out of the flower bed before. There is nothing worse. And you think you got it all and the next week, what, is it, what does it do? It sprouted right back up. So Bermuda grass, although the, we like it because it's tough. It can be a pain whenever it gets someplace that you really didn't want it to be. Uh, it will not sh tolerate shade at all. Uh, it'll tolerate light shade, but, but it's generally not a good choice for a shady area. Uh, and it goes dormant easily here, not usually. We don't usually end up with, with uh, temperatures cold enough for it to go dormant. And uh, the hybrids have to be sodded, but like I said, there are seed choices also. And it, requires the most fertilizer out of any grass that, that we use in this area. You generally want to mow it one to two inches high, depending on the variety. It's better to mow grasses a little bit too high than to mow them too short. How many of you have seen a lawn that was scalped before? And that you go, why didn't they just raise the mower a little bit? I used to have a neighbor that would get out there and mow it that short every time. And I asked him, why are you mowing your yard that short? And he says, so I don't have to mow it as often. Well, after I explained to him the damage that it was doing to the grass, he raised the, the deck a little bit. But uh, it looks awful when it's cut like that. And you can fertilize it uh, generally a couple of times a year. Um, we had one of the big questions we had after the freeze was, uh, should I go ahead and put fertilizer on my grass? The answer was no. 
you, you need to wait until you've mowed it at least two to three times before you go back to fertilizing it. So uh, down here, we actually do, we have adequate nitrogen in our soil, so it's not a huge problem. Uh, we do tell people to test their soil. Um, Port Aransas has a soil testing campaign going on right now. So if you know anybody that might need a soil test, you can tell them to go see Ray. She's got uh, the sample kits in her office or at, at the office and they can get that done free of charge. We generally find that we have enough nitrogen, uh, but uh, that usually we benefit from a couple of light applications per year. I, I personally almost never fertilize my yard, so uh, and just simply because I don't want to mow this off. As long as it stays a nice green, I'm not trying to win the, the yard of the month or anything. I just want it to be a decent result. So. And then, uh, uh, Bermuda requires about an inch of water per week, so it does hit the irrigate requirement. Uh, you'll notice that there is some thatch, and it may require deep thatching every once in a while. Now, people will scalp it early in the spring and rake it, and that counts as deep thatching, but there are also deep thatching machines that you can rent and do that. So, um, St. Augustine, here's some of the advantages of it. it. There's lots of different varieties of it. It's very salt, salt tolerant. It's shade tolerant. Will it will it take all shade? A trick question. No, it, it won't put up with all shade. It does have to have some light, but it will take more shade than what uh, Bermuda grass will. It has to be either sodded or sprigged. It cannot be seeded, and it's adaptable to most soils. And it's much nicer to pull out of flower beds and stuff than what Bermuda grass is. It's not as much a problem. Um, the disadvantages to it it will not put up with a whole lot of foot traffic. So it's not a great choice for a soccer field or for an athletic field. And uh, it is more susceptible to diseases, uh, fungal infections and uh, bugs like it. So this is your grass that is mowed at the highest height. So I generally tell people to set the mower on all the way up and just get ready to mow it more often and makes it look better. And uh, it's only fun. it can be fertilized lightly a couple of times a year as well, and uh, it takes about an inch of water per week. And it's not it's it can also get thatched, so that can also be a problem occasionally. So this is just a quick uh, thing that shows how most of the grasses grow down here. They grow by either stolons or rhizomes, and uh, put out all these. If you scalp them, then you're cutting out actually the growing points. And so that's why scalp lawns don't do that well. So keys to a healthy lawn is to know how to properly water. You do not know how many times I see grasses that have fungal infections and the people are causing those fungal infections themselves. They're over fertilizing, they're over watering. Um, they, there are a lot of people that want to set their sprinkler systems to water 15 minutes a day. It's a bad idea. It is much better to try to work the water down into the 12 inch range than it is to keep it in the two to three inch range. Uh, because what happens when the summer heat sets in? Your, your roots to your grass are right there in the top two inches and they don't suffer that summer heat very well. So we try to encourage people to really water deeply to get that water down. Now in the sand, that can be done easily, right? You can set the sprinkler and you can water for 45 minutes to an hour and it's not a problem. What happens on clay soils, Joanne? As far as it will run off. It runs off into the street and then and then somebody from the city calls you and <laughs> your neighbor that you've been pulling the weeds and, and mowing their grass and stuff reports yeah. you. So you have to do what's called cycle soaking whenever you live where there's clay soil. And what that means is you start off in your first zone, you water for 15 or 20 minutes, usually it's until the runoff begins. Then you move to the next zone and you work it all the way around the whole lawn. And then you come back to the first zone and you repeat. And that's, it's so cycling it several times and that's pushing the water deeper down into the soil profile. And then test your soil if you can, if you get the chance and then monitor for insects and diseases. So here's some good reasons to test your soil. It's good to know what the nutrient levels are from time to time. You go to the doctor every once in a while, why? Because you want to know if you're healthy or not, right? 
or he says you're not healthy you need to come <laughs> see me so uh, it's the same way with your soil you want to know if there's an adequate amount of nutrients in there so you, you uh, check it from time to time it's good to know what your soil ph is ray do you have any idea what the soil ph tends to be out here it's generally pretty close to eight yeah, yeah pretty close to eight i did have a guy from out here who had his pH at 7.5 and I have no idea how he managed to get it there but and I know that you have some areas out here uh, that Hurricane Harvey flooded or uh, the jet surge that the pH is still sky high because of all of that salt water that came in um, but it's good to know your soil pH anybody know the optimal range for most plants six, six to seven it's generally seven to 7.5 is usually the optimal for most plants, with the exception of acid loving plants. Acid loving Moses plants. And some of the other ones like the seeds. Yes, sir. That's right. So, uh, knowing what your soil pH is, is a good thing. If your pH is too high, uh, what is the best thing that you can do to try to bring it down? Put some minerals, some ironite, sulfur soil. We, we generally recommend that you put organic matter. Organic matter is a good thing. So if you have compost, if you have anything like that, adding that to the soil is going to be a good thing for several reasons. Uh, as it breaks down, it drops the pH down. It also puts um, organic matter into the soil, which uh, creates more pore space and allows for more things to uh, occupy the soil. Uh, it also makes uh, more oxygen, more uh, gases available for the plant. In the Corpus Christi area, where we have a lot of clay, I use quite a bit of gypsum because it breaks the clay and allows some yeah. Expanded shell. Yeah, expanded shell is also really good. So that, that's the great thing. Um, we also recommend you test your soil to protect the environment. Uh, you know, I don't know about you, but throwing a lot of fertilizers and chemicals out there is not necessarily a good thing. I wanna make sure that what I'm doing is environmentally, environmentally friendly and that it's, that it's uh, good for my, my lawn and my landscape and, and just randomly throwing out fertilizer is not a good thing. Economics, how much does a good bag of fertilizer cost? $30. 20 to $25. How much does a soil test cost? Right. It's free. It's free. <laughs> Would you take a $20, $20 bill and go out there and just throw it on the yard every once in a while? I've done it before by accident, but, but I wouldn't do it on purpose. I don't think anybody would go out there and just throw money out onto the lawn, but, but there's people that do that every single year because they, they've got in their mind that, that the way to make their lawn, their landscape pretty is to fertilize and fertilize and fertilize. And we even have companies that, that want to come out and push these fertilizer programs. And I, I really encourage them to uh, ask their clientele, uh, to offer their clientele soil testing and then fertilize accordingly afterwards. And then for health, uh, the better you know all of these things, the healthier your lawn and landscape are gonna be, not only for the plants there, but for the family and the pets and, and insects and everything else that are on that. Here is what one of the soil testing kits looks like on the forms. Um, you can get extremely detailed. We, we generally don't need much more than a routine analysis, and but you can get as detailed to knowing all the micro uh, nutrients that are present, all the organic matter that's present, the salinity and the texture. So you could go up to almost $100 for a test if you really need to do, do that. The only people we really see doing that are um, like um, uh, nurseries that are raising lots of lots and lots and lots of plants and, and a little bit of change makes a big difference to how well their stuff turned out. Yes, I would like to make a, a comment about fertilizer. It's very important to know the type of fertilizer. Yes, sir. And when you're talking about grass fertilizer, mm -hmm. you don't want the first number to be above 20. I, you want I something found... around 11, 15, 16, that's the best. Nitro, the only thing that does to the grass is make it grow tall. It doesn't really fit the roots or anything. It just makes it grow tall. And that means you have to mow more. And it, it makes more a mess. It may let it grow really quick and it may look good. But in the long run, it weakens the grass. Uh, 
Like Final iron. fertilization that has some iron on it, some ironized, some two percent to five percent iron. That the iron is what makes the grass green, lowers the pH, and allows the nutrients to be absorbed by the plant. So that type of fertilizers, usually the nurseries own uh, type of fertilizer, their their the brand that they sell, like Turner's Gills, they have their own. That is formulated for our area and. For, for my test, that's the best thing to you. Yeah, our local nurseries generally know what what is uh, needed for the, the clientele in the area. So, and like I said, I don't like to mow the grass that often. So, adding, all, adding all that nitrogen is a bad thing for me. So, well, yes, I mean, if I may, one more comment about the water. In the drought, we find out that if you know how to manage your water and do it, you can have really nice grass. Just water once a week. That's true. That's, that's all you need. People to do. Yes, very thick, nice grass once a week, because we find out that by necessity. That's all we could water during the, the drought. And if you would manage your water, you have nice grass. <clears throat> that's very correct, sir. One of the other things that you know is we try to avoid is something like the weed and feed. You know, the products that have, um, you know, that are trying to do twofold. Um, it, you know, yes, it, it's probably best if you pull your weeds or like Kevin said, mow them off. But, um, you know, people tend to use that as their one stop shopping and, you know, fix everything. And it's not really a good fix. When we had the mindset uh, at one point that, that everybody's yard had to look perfect and, and here's what you did at this time of the year and, and it was on a schedule. Now we've changed our mindset to do what the what the landscape tells you it needs done, not not do what you think it needs done. So, so the soil testing is it that that we're offering for free? Is it the routine analysis? The first it thing, a, it, okay. but it it gives you the pH. Yeah, it tells I was just you. Wondering, I mean, it's enough. plenty good for the average homeowner. Homeowner, unless, like I said, you're growing, trying to grow something specific, and you need to know a little bit more detail. It, yeah, it's perfectly fine. But doesn't that change throughout your, your 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 grass and your lawn? I mean, we've got a pretty good area that we, we work with that, you know, just because of uh, your pH level, maybe. Yeah, it's, 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 you gotta, you know, take a look at the microclimate. Yes, sir. We generally recommend that you kind of break uh, things up into usage areas. So let's say that you wanted to know that you had an area that was lawn. And then you had an area that was vegetable garden, and then you had an area that was all uh, flower beds and stuff. You may want to do separate soil tests for those areas because you're you're correct. the The usage in the lawn area is going to be way different than the usage in the vegetable area or in, in that. So yeah, you may want to collect and do separate samples for those. Also, when you do your soil, when you take your sample, you're going to take a bunch all across your yard and mix it together so you're not like making sure you're not just capturing what's in that little corner that's another yeah we usually recommend uh 12 to 15 random samples throughout the usage area and then you're going to mix them all together to give you some idea are you, are you disagreeing oh, no, we have no we have um, you have a lot of usage areas <laughs> we have a lot of areas and we do have vegetable gardens that that are you know done just you know, we, we organically do it. We do everything organic matter. And we have usage with uh, high maintenance and, and grass areas, and then other areas that are um, you know, flood prone, and then other areas that are just completely barren. You know, with, with limited palms and, and, and stuff. And stuff like that. So, I'm, I'm guessing that it might be worthwhile. Uh, you know, one year to sample quite a few of those different areas. And you may find that there's big differences or you may find there's really not as big a differences as you thought there really were. And then you'll have a lot better idea of what, where you need to go from there. Sure. Yeah. There's there's one area there. with the uh, salt cedars and I'm wondering, the salt cedars died in the recent storm. Yes, they did. And then nothing used to really grow under those salt cedars. So I'm thinking that's probably messed up the pH with all that salt. Um, I don't, I think, yeah, they bring salt up to the, to the soil. Yeah, they, they, they fix it. Yeah. Yeah. 
So we, we, we amended this all along, tons of sand on it and then planting. It could be too that the salt cedars were pulling so much water that there wasn't enough water for anything to grow there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different reasons why stuff doesn't grow under certain things. You know, under pine trees, the pine needles actually um, serve as a mulch, but they also have a chemical toxin in them that, that uh, inhibits growth of other plants. So it, it, I guess it's going to be interesting to see how long it takes. I'm assuming as first, when you first start seeing grasses and, and native plants and stuff starting to come up in that area, then you'll know that, that maybe it's uh, returning back to a suitability for other plants to be. That's a, that's there. that's kind of our goal is to, to use as, as much native and adaptive to the area as possible. We, we were commenting as we were driving in today that uh, we remember what these areas look like after the hurricane and that it's um, amazing the the recovery and the level that things have gotten back to in this short amount of time so i remember going out to uh, to um no where the walkway was where all the brush had, had all had come uh, in and looking at it and it was like oh my gosh mm -hmm. trying to talk about how were you going to get all of that out of there and remove it and, it was a mess. Well, I know um, in talking with the nurseries, because um, I have a, an addiction, I'm at a nursery at least once a week and you know, trying to find you know, plants to, to replace. And um, one of the things they said that you know, they're really having a hard time getting the, the natives, you know, the native plants for this area, um, you know, that it's, it's going to be a while. It's, it's going to be a while till everything that would have been here on its own kind of gets going again. And you're really going to have to be careful when you're shopping for plants right now because there was so much stuff damaged at, at, at uh, you know, nurseries, at, at wholesale growers that the uh, local nurseries and all across the state or just having to take whatever merchandise they, they can get a hold of right now. So make sure when you're in there that it's stuff that is suitable for your area. Well, and this is a really good plant guide. And you know, the, um, depending on where you live, um, a lot of the nurseries will have developed their own. I know Gills and Turners, you know, have a, a kind of list that they go by and, you know, James Gills really good about answering questions about just about anything. Any of these at your local nurseries yeah. are gonna do that. And- um, yeah, They're trying real hard to get quality. They quality are. Materials. Everything is a little more expensive or sometimes a lot more expensive than what it's been because of availability. But um, they're slowly starting to get things back in. And I know I had asked about can ray bottle brushes and they had said it would probably, you know, it might be in the fall before, you know, they're they're you know available again so it's 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 going to take a little while did you guys notice how much the mother's day flowers went up they were significantly more expensive this time around than, than before all right uh bill bill do we have any questions online yes um from sandra williams is a question about is are there any restrictions on planting on city right of ways, the strip between road and sidewalk in front of a house. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Do you know the answer to that? Uh, the answer to that, the best I could do would be um, if you chose, well, okay, um, a, a co worker a year or so ago asked me, she was wanting to plant some oak trees in that strip between the street and the sidewalk. And she thought, oh, we just make this wonderful screen. And I said, well, you know, you're going to spend quite a bit of money on these oak trees that you want to plant. You know, they're going to tear your sidewalk up, you know, from the roots. And then the other thing is if any utility work needs to be done, if it's street widening or if there's, you know, if that's where your water mains are going through, um, if, if it's necessary to do that repair, your trees are, are they're going to be gone. You know, so anything you're putting there, um, it should be, you know, low and manageable or something that you could move if you needed to. But certainly if you start planting a lot of trees and larger vegetation, there's a good chance that it's going to be either cut back or, you know, damaged if there is work to be done. 
I think there's a city code that you're not supposed to be able to block the view in that area. If there are driveways or that is supposed to be able to do traffic, so you cannot have anything that would block the view of the traffic. Well, and I think we've all, you know, gone to that intersection that whenever you're turning, you can't see anything because everything is kind of overgrown and, and in the way. And so you just kind of, you know, inch out trying to, to see whether there's anything coming. So um, you can, you can plant it there, but it may not stay there. And uh, Sandra, Sandra is clarifying that she's asking more about uh, ground covers, uh, low maintenance ground covers. That probably so, wouldn't be a problem. So our answer for her is yes, there is a city code on it and the city has uh, the right to do whatever they want to with it. She, she can plant it, but keep it uh, simple and inexpensive. Um, I know Doug Wade, the landscape architect that designed the Xeriscape Garden, he always just kind of dug it up and planted cosmos there. He had the most beautiful, you know, orange and yellow cosmos that that bloomed in the summertime that receded themselves. And, you know, they weren't they weren't a problem. And he didn't have to mow it. So, you know, he was planting things that would easily recede and, and bloom and give some color, but, you know, wouldn't weren't going to be damaged if um, you know, if the city did have to do any kind of repairs or, you know, structural work on the road or sidewalks. Is there an area locally where we can forage for uh, native dune plants? Not to my knowledge, there's not. No, and I would not recommend going in our dunes because it's all protected by the state, so. <laughs> I, I was actually uh, looking at a, a newsletter this morning that I received and, and there's a, a federal prosecution case right now for uh, some folks in California that went into the seashores and were collecting uh, succulents and then trying to ship them overseas and that broke federal laws so I would be very careful doing anything any type of foraging without making sure that people mm -hmm. now I would say you could reach out to your native plant society and they probably could give you much better guidance on it than what I can Yes, you were just talking about Cosmos, but I don't see it on this list. Does it have another name? Cosmos is just, it's a seed. It's a flowering a seed. It's a seed. You, oh, would, okay. you would get it in a seed packet oh, and, okay. you know, probably rough up the soil a little bit. Okay. It's, um, it's, it would be just like planting uh, wildflowers or blue bonnets or marigolds or, you know, whatever you chose. But they do have a little bit of height to them and they're very vibrant in color. Um, the other thing about moving plants from one area to the other. Um, you know, I know that it's it's not recommended to say go out into a ranch at George West and start digging up plants and bringing them, you know, back to, you know, this area because there's the soil is different. I mean, it's it's some things will will do well and other things won't. My, my experience with foraging is most places don't want you coming in and digging anything up. No. But if they've got plants that go to seed, they're generally, you know, will work with you. Some of them will and let you collect seed without any problem. Mm -hmm. So if you know that there's an area that's, that's got plants that, that do go to seed, you might contact the, the landowner and, and ask to go that route. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay, so moving on. Uh, did, were there more questions, Bill? No, nothing else. Just maybe the materials that are handed out, Ray, will those be available? at the Facebook page or? I can email them to them. So I should post on the chat your email address? Uh, yeah, I just haven't put their email. Uh, I, you have a digital form of that. I have a digital we do, we have a digital yeah, I can put it on the Facebook page as well for the event. I, can send you I the think digital. Sarah could probably send it to all the people that registered for the event. Yeah, I all can right. send a follow up email. But yes, we can email it to them with that or, or post it without any problem. All right, so moving on, because I think we're about to run out of time. Um, <laughs> we have pavers, ground covers, and shrubs. Uh, we always recommend, like she was talking about with slopes, that you use some sort of suitable ground cover to hold the soil in place and to make sure that things are doing well. Uh, they've incorporated shrubs into this area as well. They put pavers in, in this area and suitable grasses and shrubs here. And then we have a very large paved area with a fire pit and a seating area there. So here they've used rock. I'm not always a big fan of rock, but if it's used properly, 
it looks okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not real crazy about going to a house and seeing that they've just rocked the entire thing. And if you're going to rock it, you need to be choosing really tough, durable plants. You know, what is, what are your stems? Cause there's, yeah. it's going to hold heat. So that is, that's a, an example. They actually did a pretty good job with the rock in that because it's, it's a small area and then they've got lots of plants incorporated. So it's really nice. <laughs> and then watering efficiently. Um, it's advisable that you do an audit of your watering system. If you're watering by hand, then you probably don't have to audit. If you have a sprinkler system, you ought to check it at least a couple of times a year to make sure that it's working efficiently and properly. Um, at the Xeriscape Garden yesterday, we found broken sprinkler heads. So it's a lot easier to, to have a sprinkler head uh, damaged or broken than you think it is. So uh, check that and uh, run it through the system at least a couple of times. I I hope people turn their sprinklers off during the freeze. I'm, I'm guessing there were a lot of people that forgot about it and, and there were a lot of repairs. And then uh, rain sensors are a good idea. A rain sensor will act automatically cut the sprinkler system off if, if in the event of a very small amount of rain, I think it only takes a tenth of an inch or something and it cuts it off most of the time. And uh, you have to know what your rules are for stage one water restrictions, uh, Stephen. What are the rules for stage one water restrictions right now? Currently, the uh, city of Corpus Christi is within stage one. We are uh, once a week watering. Uh, we encourage kind of to uh, water, uh, like the group has said, you know, a little goes a long way. You can water on your trash day, but it's once a week. And uh, if you water, like you, they were saying, you know, for a long time, so you get that, that, that you know, water seeping into the soil, so your, your, your roots can grow down and be more uh, tolerant to climate change and uh, if the drought gets even worse. So that, that's a good thing. So yes, uh, once a week watering is where we were, and hand watering, we encourage to and shut on the valve. You can hand water anytime, right? Yes. Uh, if it's a sprinkler system, you can only water on your trash day. We encourage people to water as early as they can in the morning because uh, you have less evaporation that way. We yeah. don't encourage people to water uh, in the evening unless you're unless you're hand watering like pot plants or something. But still, it's better to water in, in make, the morning. Make sure you don't get the runoff, you know, because you know, like I was saying <coughs> earlier, you you want to keep your water because it's a valuable commodity it, on your plants and mm -hmm. on your and choose sprinklers. I mean, if you're if you're dragging a hose and attaching a sprinkler, choose a sprinkler that's going to put out low, big drops. You don't those things that are the big arching wand things. All it does is it. it I mean, it just blows it everywhere else and evaporates, and it, it very little of it is going to actually get to where you want it. You're going to be wasting a lot of water. So use something that's going to to put out big, heavy, you know, lower drops instead of all of that that gets caught in the wind and doesn't really do you any good. Yes, sir. A quick one. Uh, also, what's your source of your water? I mean, are you using city water or using well water? Something that I find out when I came here to the university, you know, uh, city water has usually a little bit high pH. You got to put the iron. But here we were using well water that already has pretty high iron. <laughs> So I had to change that, and mm -hmm. the, the source of your water is going to change your the pH in your soil. Uh, between the well water around here and the, the city water. Yes, that's correct. All right, moving on. Uh, we, it's good to use mulches to reduce evaporation, to reduce the amount of weeds are coming up. The mulch, as it breaks down, uh, it goes into the soil as organic matter, and uh, it, it's overall just a good thing. There is uh, free mulch available in the city of Corpus Christi out at the landfill. I don't know if you guys uh, have any out in Port A or not. So you have mulch? mulch available? No. Uh, there, there was There's one, one time, but it, it, it all had um, trash in it. Yeah. 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 There is some concern um, that you don't always know where the, the board and the material and everything came from. That, that they're I have gone over to Rockport and gotten mulch because it was all like live oak and good stuff where oh yeah i imagine the amount of mulch they had after yeah but uh you call ahead they don't always have it in corpus you have two grades of mulch 
the very fine molds that have been turned over and cooked, that's probably one of the best things that you can use in your lunch, in your flower beds or anything. I mean, it lowers the pH, is from a staff that is around area, and this that's the, the most thing that I can use. The only problem I have is convincing my client that it's coming from the Tampa is good for you. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really, really good. There, there's just some stigma with the Dumpa. I wonder Badum. why. <laughs> I remember when we lived in the Dallas area, there was a furniture store called the Dump. Oh. It, it was a it was nice furniture. It was just when they got to the end of production and they had a few pieces that were left, they, they sold it out to the dump. Any moments to finish it? No. <laughs> they should, some of them should have. Okay, <laughs> moving on. So mulch adds a, a nice look to your landscape, prevents erosion, reduces weeds, and helps to save water. And there's more than just wood mulches. We actually have seen plastic mulches in the um, rubber mulches. Rubber mulch. In the last few years, uh, some people use rocks, gravel, um, pine straw. Pine straw. The, the key to mulch is use what's available to you. Uh, you know, you don't, there's some people that, that uh, get caught up on a certain type of mulch and think that's what they have to use. But like he was saying, there's really good mulch out there. Uh, just use what's available to you and, and don't be afraid to, to change and do something a little bit different. Appropriate maintenance. Uh, employ good horticultural practices. We have work days from time to time at our Jersey State Garden. Um, you, it's not good to go for long periods of time without getting out and doing something from time to time out in, in the garden. Uh, mow the lawns frequently, but at a higher level. Fertilize only as necessary. Get rid of the weeds if possible. Uh, we use a lot of water, just like the grass does. Maintain your irrigation systems and do pruning at appropriate time of year as needed. Here's a picture of the Xeriscape Learning Center and Design Center. It with, does not look that, like that. It doesn't right look now. like this anymore with our <laughs> carbon bridge. It's not going to be there too much longer. Well, I don't know, maybe, maybe not longer. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> yes, we, we have had significant damage. Uh, I think that yucca is gone. Yes. Um, that grass is. The Sinisa, the purple. Yeah, you know, the Sinisa is gone. Is pretty much gone. The really? fountain grass is gone. Um, the rosemary is gone. There's a lot there's of that. There's a lot of things gone. that have changed. Yeah. Things you can't control besides people. That was after oh, Harvey. Oh, that's actually on there. Okay. Uh, you can't control the weather. That is after Hurricane Harvey. You're right. Um, we actually, we were shocked with what it looked like, but at the same time, took a sigh of relief because it, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. One of the things that was a beneficial for us, um, we lost a lot of our trees. Well, our garden had become you know, very mature and it was shady. And so a lot of our plants were getting too much shade. So it, it did, after we got over the heartache and we cleaned it all up, it was beneficial that we got a lot of sun back into mm -hmm. our area and we could start all over again. Yeah, we'd already been having some discussions about Remove them or leave them. Remove them or leave them. Well, Harvey decided for us. It, it was like, they're gone. Animals, you can't control them. And then people, you can't control people. We have uh, visitors. Lots of, of human visitors to the Xeriscape Garden after dark. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. Sometimes it's shocking. <laughs> We found some pretty interesting things, haven't we? Especially after we cleaned up this last time. Like, oh, I didn't know all that was under there. <laughs> There's more pictures from Harvey. Um, that I think was from earlier this month. Uh, that's just a map of uh, the state. Um, you know, it has actually improved quite a bit from. The previous month from April. Um, and I know that, uh, well, Steve, you could probably speak to that. We're right now, we're not, the city is not in severe drought or exceptional drought any longer. Well, yes. So the area of, you know, along the coast, this kind of area has improved to outside of any uh, drought condition. But uh, I want everybody to look at, look at the picture and remember where our water sources are. We 
we get our water from the west. So like where it says an oasis in that area, it's still in a severe drought situation. And so we got to remember, we got to remember that. So hopefully with this next week, uh, we're crossing our fingers that area uh, between like uh, Crystal City and uh, Catula and kind of the Frio area is expecting maybe between three to five inches of rain. Don't know if that's going to happen, but if it did, it would be really beneficial to our whole overall water supply. So it's not just how much we get, but where we get it. So that you always got to think about that. That was one of the common things that I would always hear was that, um, well, you know, we just got all, we, we, you know, we, well, we could get 15 inches of rain here, but that didn't eliminate the drought in our watershed. And so that just meant that we didn't need to water here. But, you know, as Steve said, remember where our source, you know, the source of our, of our water is coming from. And so, you know, when any, any time it rains up the country, it's always much more beneficial. No, you can keep it. Okay. So simple, simple steps to make a water wise garden. One, make a wish list. Well, we've all got wish lists. Some, some of us just don't write them down, but we've all got wish lists. Take inventory of what's in your area and make a plan and then begin to install your xeriscape. You can't do it all at one time. Uh, it's really the thing that you can do it all at one time. So put it into phases or, or group it into sections and think about how you're going to accomplish that and then maintain and enjoy and make every drop count and don't waste the water. Here are some plants from the Xeriscape Garden. We have American Beautyberry. Bicolor Iris. A bicolor Iris. There were our bottle brushes. They were just starting to bloom before the freeze. They're coming back, but they were cut back to six inches, but they are coming back. You cut your, all, of your, the, all of your bottle brushes back we do. Okay, because we le we've left ours, but there's still there seems to be some new coming up. I left mine in my in my personal in my yard because mine were probably mine were up to like the utility lines. They oh, were okay. they were quite large and they were gorgeous. And um, I kept waiting and thinking something was going to happen. You know, put yeah. out the plant and it did not. Okay. And so I um, probably three weeks ago cut them back to about eight inches and they're starting to grow. And you have to remember that even though it looks like these tiny little sprouts, there's a massive root structure under there. Yeah. So once that they get going, you know, they will grow rapidly back because they've got a great root system. But right now that little eight inch stub with some little leaves on it is not very attractive, yeah. but how, it'll get there. How does that apply to oleander? I know a lot of us had to go ahead and cut all cut the back, back. amazing well. amount of oleander in our, in our property, but it's all. We, we've had enough time that if it was going to put back out in the canopy, it would have done it by now. So um, anything that has not put back out in your canopy, go ahead and whack it back. Yes, sir. Oleanders. Cut it all the way to the root. Clean it out. Don't go with the scratch deal. You're going to find a lot of green with your scratch. Whatever is in top is going to die. It's going to come back from the roots. Um, whatever you live here is going to be full of uh, bumblebees or carpenter bees. So they're going to bore in there and make a mess. So cut it all the way to the ground. The same yes. with your esperanzas. Yes. They will come back from the ground like crazy. <laughs> There were things that uh, we immediately decided at the Xeriscape Garden to go ahead and cut them back right after the freeze, the very first work that we had. And there were things that we decided to wait on. The things that we immediately cut back are all looking great now. So, um, well, there's a couple. There's a couple. Well, like to, yeah, no. a few things, no. But most everything that we cut back, the esperanzas, the bottle brushes, the um, uh, the um, ginger philodendrons. All of that, we, we, I mean, we cut it way down and it's all coming back and good just fine. So yeah, it's time to go ahead and cut it back. And uh, even, even the palm trees at this point, you should be able to tell pretty much which ones are gonna make it and which ones it's time to. Uh, the Brogalini's, the pygmy date palms, no, no. they're all gone. Some of the queen no, no. palms, that's about a 50-50 on those. Most of the fan palms came back. Um, the, the Mediterranean fan palms, 
breeze through the freeze with no problem. Check the, the sable and the native. The sables, the natives sables made it through the freeze with no did. problem. <laughs> they made it. But it, it's clear a lot of the green palms didn't make it, the robolinis didn't make it, uh, the foxtails, a lot of them didn't make it. Yes, sir. Well, you can help the, the palms by going up, especially if something that you can reach and checking that ground there. And if there's some dead in the tap, you can cut some of that and clean it up and find good, yeah. good in the crown and spray some uh, stuff for fertilizer and they're coming back really quick. The problem is that most people, most homeowners don't have the ability to, to scurry yeah. up their home to do that. <laughs> Uh, you know, I also believe you can afford to wait. I mean, but we're uh, we're not but about three weeks from hurricane season, the start of hurricane season. But you you can afford to wait a little bit longer, unless your unless your palm that you're afraid is dead is in a perilous place where if it falls over, it's going to cause significant damage. If it's out in the middle of the yard and and it gets blown over and and it's not a big deal, you can afford to wait. It's not a it's not a problem. Some of but, the succulents that that just were absolutely disgusting after the freeze. I mean, they just, they were squishy and wet and nasty. Um, once they've kind of dried up, they're actually sending up some pups, you know, around them. So some of those are starting to come back, but, um, you know, they were the most vile smelling, rotting, just <laughs> disgusting. Awful. And then you pick them up and they just dripped. And so, but that some of those that did dry out are actually putting up a lot of pups too. And we had some mangaves that we were convinced were toast and there's still pups coming up. Uh, the, all the aloe vera at the Searscape Garden, um, there was live aloe vera underneath them. So I was trying to tell people, you know, don't be so quick to just jerk it all out. Um, remove a little bit and see if there's live, live stuff under it. And they're all coming out the um, San Severia looked like it was toast when we first got down there. We chose to just cut it back and it's all coming. It looks actually going to look better than it did before the freezer. Yeah. So, yeah. so let's go ahead and get through these. I think this is just about the end. There is crepe myrtle. Yep. And we have desert willow. The, uh, this, this actually toasted it. Yeah, the it's freeze toasted. toasted it. It's not coming back. That's but, the firecracker. Fire. Yeah. Our firecrackers came back. Um, the ones we had in the Thursday yeah. yeah. Mine and my at home came back, yeah. and they came back in different spots too. <laughs> they because, came back. I think it's because we had it in a in a raised area, uh, mm -hmm. up very high, and I think it got too cold. Too cold. Yeah. Camellias are coming back slowly. We, but we cut them way back, and they're they're coming out just fine. Uh, surprisingly. Reflexive. Yeah, they came back with no problem. These came back. Uh, these came back, but did have significant damage. The, the, grasses, the grasses have really surprised me. They're just really, really slow to respond. They're not doing much of anything. Here we have Millie didn't live. The it. Because yeah. there, I mean, every yeah. single Gulf Millie and Puerto Rancis looked perfectly fine after the her after the freeze. Every single grass we have right. in the Zerstead Garden looks like. Well, well you should plant native grasses, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing was we had the uh, one you had in the picture. The Gulf Millies are doing really did really well. Right. The Japanese U. Um, yeah, it looked fine. It for looked a long beautiful time. until this last couple of weeks, and now we have all these big dead spots. That's I mean, weird. It, it's weird because it's it's a large mature tree, and now it's it's brown and green. <laughs> I think everything in all these pictures made it through the freeze, so is there anything that didn't? No. So that's a Barbados? Oh, that's a Mexican. Oh, that's the Mexican. Oh, that's, uh, the next one's a Rotama. Honeysuckle, Rotama. Soapberry. Soapberry. We don't have soapberry. Okay. Yeah, those all survived. This is the your rock, rock rose, rose yeah. and then the yopon, and then Texas Malor was blooming a week after the freeze. It was beautiful. That's awesome. <laughs> that's the end. Do you have any questions for us? Yes, sir. I was very surprised that the dwarf 
on hollow branches, the small plants Little did plants. did much better than the trees. Yeah. Yes, they did. So ours are coming blooming. back too. Yeah, and our Hannah Ray is coming back, but it's a challenging conversation. Yeah, we might have to chop it down. To help us, our two special it. guests. First, we have cleanup expert Matt Paxton from the. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Are you, are any other suggestions of nurseries? There's Turner's and Hills and Bloomers in Rockport. And when we went the other day, there's one like in Bayside. Has anybody been over to that one? I don't remember what the name of it is. And I've seen one advertised on Wilsey Drive, but when I drive by, it looks more like just a landscaping type. She'll do well. She's a wholesale place. Are there any other suggestions of nurseries? No more, as far as I know. There used to be Dave's Native Plants in Rockport. Yeah. You should still be there. I think they're open by appointment. Native Dave. Native Dave, yeah. Um, I know that one day when they I had a lot of stuff Gills, right they now. were saying that they have had so many customers come in from San Antonio because San Antonio was hit really hard too, and that Hello? people were driving to Corpus to find plants to take back to San Antonio. Yeah, um, yeah still one in Taft. Yes. I there think there was a nursery, nursery in Taft. Taft. That was mostly trees, wasn't it? The McNamee uh, or the Taft. Um, the and there was one along on Highway, Highway 77 well, at uh, Bishop. There had been one down by Bishop. Bay, uh, Bay Area landscape, you know, they used to be on Staples. They're close. They're close. Yeah. 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 They, 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 they reopened. Where did they go? It's they're they're down down right behind it. Now it's just a very small place. I can't understand anybody who's. It's a Bay, Bay Area landscape <laughs> has, has moved. Some uh, gibberish to cost, me. But they do have a lot of rocks, a lot of amazing But they don't rocks. have nursery. They do have right. nursery plants, yes. Yeah. Where, and where are they now? Off of La Costa. La Costa. Like that business drive, a street oh, or whatever, oh, oh. Uh, down Woodridge. So. Oh, okay. It's not too yeah, far from where they were. Far. Same area. Okay. 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 I'm, I'm a, I was I was sad. I thought they had completely closed. Uh, George mentioning, she mentioned bloomers. Uh -huh. There's a lady that used to work at Lowe's and Aransas. She opened a, a place off of the bypass, you know, the 35. And it's she's got a lot of stuff there. And there's, I mean, she just started, but there's a whole bunch. And she's like really a really good gardener. I mean, she helped us with our garden in Ingleside. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and she opened that place. I don't know if you've, it's the, it's a new place with all the scag mowers, Daniels, something. It's off the bypass. It's on the left. Like Rockport and, and there, no, there used to be a ton yes, of the, the, uh, 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 nurseries. Not the old uh, 35, but the new thing. San Antonio and all the And she's got but a they were all, all, they they were all heavily damaged by the uh, For sure. It's next to Daniel's. The native uh, Texas nursery. Yeah. Yeah. It's there. She's got they a had a ton of plants stuff. after the tree. She's good. She's good. Basically, just. I've gotten, I get an email from them every Friday. The last two or three weeks, they're like, I'm so sorry. Like, this is. However many years they've been open, they've never had to say we don't have anything, mm -hmm. and that's that's a wholesaler, a native plant wholesaler. They're just yeah, gills like their selection yeah. of native plants have been like cleaned out yeah. regularly. It was like they yeah. had good inventory kind of after the freeze, and then it's just all gone now. On the bright side, yeah, the, nur Sad. the nurseries are telling me they have never had a better two years in the whole time they've been in business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People gardened yeah. last year that had never gardened before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the true. pandemic drove people to guys. gardening, and then and then yeah. the freeze. Well, just finding a parking place at, at Turner's and Gills has become but, a challenge. But that's a good thing for us because <laughs> that means, you know, some of the facilities, it gives them the money to improve their facilities. It gives them the money to do some things that, that they've been wanting to do, but for I don't know to do. There was, um, I went to one in um, outside of New Braunfels going towards Bernie and found quite a few natives there. Um, and I can't remember the name of it. I've never been there before, but they did have a, a good selection. Um, it's just kind of way out in the middle of nowhere. There's a really good one um, between LaGrange and College Station. I'm trying to think of what that town is, that, but there's a really Navis nice- Navistoke, no. Mm, no. no. Navistoke, no. No, it's, it's, uh, it's past yeah. the area where they've got all of the little oh an antique and all, oh. all those things. Yeah, there's, there's one, Martha's Bloomers is on the, off of the highway up there and they have a lot of- 